Now last week we started a six-week discovery into the culture we're creating here at Junction Community Church. More specifically, we are looking at the values that define the culture. And so over the six-week course that we're, we're moving into as a church, we're really looking at the values that define who we are as a church. And values are important. Values are important because values always precede behavior. Values always precede culture. Values always precede how we talk, how we think, how we interact with people. Values always come first. And here's the reality. All of us have values. Uh, we, we pick up those values along life. Uh, sometimes we pick them up from our child, uh, uh, childhood and our upbringing, and other times we pick it up from our, uh, our work environments or maybe our, our, our extended family environments. But we pick up on these values and these cultural, uh, the, cre- these cultural underlining things that, 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 uh, that life offers us, and we really don't even think about it sometimes. But really what I want to do in this series is take, a, take time to really pause and say, hey, this is who we are. This is what we believe. This is what we value. And so that's what we're doing as we move into this series. Now last week, our takeaway, I want to get right to it because it sets the tone for this entire series. And it's this. Culture is created by default or by design. Be intentional. Culture is created by default or by design. And so in your families, in our church, in your businesses, in in any capacity of life, Culture is created either by default or by design. And, uh, and here's the thing. If we allow culture to be created by default, ultimately we will take the path of least resistance. Yeah, that's just the nature of it. Like we will just, I, I, I wish I can tell you that if I just took that path of least resistance, my kids were going to be amazing. But I'll tell you what, unless I'm intentional with them, uh, they're going to struggle through life. And I can't just leave the responsibility of the growth of my children to their educational environments or even to their environments here at at church. Like, yes, I value these environments, but ultimately it's the job and responsibility of both my wife and I to be very intentional about the culture we're creating. Now, I don't want to get too deep into this, but uh, the bottom line is that every day we have opportunities to teach our children. And yesterday I had one of those opportunities where I encountered a very disgruntled woman and I was thinking to myself, thank God you are not a man. Just kidding. Some of y'all are like, dude, this dude's evil, bro. This guy, this guy is like... So I, 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 I encountered her and she, she was very like, very rude. And, and, and honestly, you know, somebody when they push you and they're rude, you just naturally, what happens? Like that, that ugly part of you just comes out. Like, Really? And my daughter was right there. And so I really wanted to say, look, baby doll, this is not how we treat people. Even when we disagree, uh, we don't treat people that way. And, and, and we value people and we put people first. And, and we may not always agree. And, and it turned into this, this moment that was like this, this, you know, that right there is a crazy lady. From that moment <laughs> to the moment that I had to really teach my daughter something. Again, it was about instilling a value. It was about saying that all people matter. It was about saying, look, that we never mistreat people because we uh, disagree with them about something. Because there's a lot of things we're going to disagree with uh, people about in life. Whether that be within the context of our own families. Or whether it be within the context of a small group experience. Or here at church. Or in our work environment. We're going to disagree with people. But the value that I wanted to instill in my daughter is we always treat people differently. And here's the beautiful thing about my Miss Salem. Miss Sayla said, I thought that lady was going to come up to you and give you a compliment. And I'm like, baby, you are beautiful because that's the way you see the world. You see the world as all compliments and positive experiences and great things. And I'm like, you know, uh, you keep on to that. You hold that culture. You always see people in the best light. And, I, and it just made me so proud because at seven years old, she already sees the world in a completely different capacity. So my point is this. Culture will happen by default or by design. We have to be intentional. We have to be intentional in, our, in, in how we create culture. And it happens in cultures all around us. It's in our homes, our businesses, our church. It's in society. And if we're not careful, again, we will take the path of least resistance. And so to create a winning culture, we have to be intentional. We must be intentional. Now, last week we talked about one of the values that point to our culture here at Junction Community Church, and that was compassion. We talked about compassion. 
And really, as a church, let me just say, I am super proud to be a part of Junction Community Church. I'm proud of every one of you. You guys make me so proud. You guys are incredible. And, I, and any time that I, I get to, uh, trust me, I just brag on y'all. I'm like, man, y'all, know, y'all have no clue, man. We got some great people in our church. And I said this yesterday, and I say it all the time. Like, if I wasn't the pastor, this would be my church. Like, this is where I would want to attend. So I love... Uh, the church that we have, and I love who we are, and I love the fact that you all are so compassionate. And last week we talked about that value of compassion. It's important for us. We want to be compassionate within our community. We want to feed the least of these. Remember Jesus really out of Matthew 25 from last week. Jesus, he talked about uh, those at the end where he would separate the sheep from the goats, and he would come to the sheep and say, thank you because when I was in need, you you, 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 you met my need. And really, he talked about clothing and about food and about visiting them while they're in prison and, and, and giving them shelter when they were at need, in need of that. And, and, and the righteous were like, Jesus, when did we do that? We've never done that for you. And he's like, whatever you did to the least of these, you did it to me. And really, at Junction Community Church, we want to do for the least of our brothers and sisters. It's not they, it's not them, it's not those people. Those are my people. That, those are my people, and I want to love on them. And I just say I'm so proud to call JCC home because we definitely operate in that value. But today, I want to tackle a second value. So get ready. Start taking notes if you haven't already started. Because I want to dig into a second value that we have here at Junction Community Church. Again, it's a part of the culture we're creating, and it affects every one of us. This value affects every one of us. And really, this value, among the many values that we have, has the potential to speak to each of us very personally. So I want you, as I begin to talk over the next couple minutes here, I want you to begin to take notes and ask yourself for you, how does this relate to me again? Whether this is your first time here or whether you've been here all of your life, I want you to begin to make an application right away to your life because this value does affect every one of us very personally. And uh, let me preface this value with the belief that it's God's idea, and not only is it God's idea, but it's God's desire, okay? So the value is growth. And God wants to see that we grow individually, and I would even say collectively, as a church. God loves us right where we are. Listen to this, because it's very important. God loves us right where we are, but He loves us too much to leave us there. I don't know if you heard that. God loves us right where we are. It doesn't matter what we've been through. It doesn't matter our past. It doesn't matter what we did last night, last year, or ten years ago. God loves us right where we're at. But He loves us so much that He's like, Son, i got better things in store for you. I can't leave you there. Because as a, as a good, loving, heavenly Father, that would be irresponsible for Him to say, Son, I love you. I'm going to leave you right there. No, no, no. That's not what He does. He says, Son, I love you right where you're at, but I've got better things for you. And I want to bring you along to that path of what I have in store for you. So God's desire for us is that we grow. God loves us right where we're at, but He loves us too much to leave us there. He wants to develop us into what I would call mature believers who experience a growing relationship with Him. You see, here at Junction Community Church, we exist uh, to lead people into a growing relationship with Jesus Christ. If you want to know what we're about, that's what we're about. We want to help you Grow in your relationship with Jesus Christ. And here's the reality. We're at all different levels when it comes to our relationship with with Him. In fact, some of you today, whether you're watching online or here here in this place, some of you today, you're saying to yourself, I'm not even really, I don't even really have a relationship with Christ. I don't even know how I really feel about that. And let me just say this, that's okay. I want you to be completely comfortable with that. I want, even though you don't have all the dots together yet, and you're like, I don't even know if I believe, let me just say you're in a safe environment. You're right where you need to be. And so I, I want to encourage you, though, to challenge that mindset that says, I don't believe in God, and I'm not sure if He's real, and I'm not sure if He exists. I want to challenge you in that. And just for the next few minutes, I want you to just expand your, your mind for a moment and begin to think, what if? Well, what if? What if? What if God is real? And so there's all types of people here today from all different walks and all different places in life. But the key to growing, the key to development is that we need to know where we are. And after we know where we are, we've got to know where do we want to go. And so that's true for every one of us. Like, how many of you remember being in a mall or 
being at the mall, and here you kind of, the mall's real small, so you know where you're at. Um, you just look down and say, oh, that's where I am. Uh, but I remember being in a mall, really big. You ever been to the Mall of America? Anybody been to the Mall of America? Dude, that is crazy, right? Like, that's too much. Like, don't ever take your wife there, men, or your daughters. Uh, I have, man, I trust me, that's trouble written all over it. But here's the thing. When you're in a mall and you don't know where you're at, you go to the directory and it says you are here, right? So you've got to know where you're at in order to know where you want to go. You've got to be able to know this is where I'm at, and then you've got to secondly define this is where I want to go. Where is the exit? Because we want to get out of here fast. Like, we do not want anybody else looking in any other store. Lord, put blinder on their eyes. We want to get out of here fast. And all the men said, amen. All right. Some of you ladies, though, you're like, I don't even like this shop. This guy's crazy, though. Um, you get him online, and he buys all kinds of crazy stuff. Um, So after we know where we want to go, then we can employ what I would call a strategic plan to help us get there. But before we get into the how-tos of that, I want to discover growth from God's perspective. And so there are several biblical passages that point to our growth as believers in Christ. And I want to look at a few that will help us get a biblical understanding for this idea or this value of growth. And because there's far too much to cover this morning, I encourage you, as I always do, to read beyond what we're reading this morning. You gotta, every time we read from God's Word, let me just say this, as a value even, like you need to read before and after it. Like you need to go home and you need to figure out what was happening before that passage and what's happening after it. Because on Sunday morning, we, we, there's only so much we can talk about. There's only so much that we can unpack, but there is much more to discover. And so I encourage you always to go back and read beyond the text that we're reading. And so today, we're going to start off in a situation we discover in the church in Corinth. And I'm going to ask that you would go with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 3, whether you have a Bible, your U version. And if not, then we have it right here on screen for you. Um, but it's 1 Corinthians chapter 3, starting in verse 1. And I want to, it's really a story of what's going on here, but we're going to see the value of growth come out of it, okay? And so I'll, let's start off reading, and then we'll unpack the pieces that are important for today, um, because there's just, again, far too much here for us to discover. But brothers and sisters, I would not address you as people who live by the Spirit, but as people who are still worldly, mere infants in Christ. Now, this is the Bible, okay? And this is the apostle writing to the church in Corinth. And these were the people that were closest not only to the apostles, but really they weren't very very far removed from Jesus. These people should have had it all figured out, but guess what? They didn't. And not only did they not have it figured out, But as Paul writes, he says, brothers and sisters, I would not address you as people who live by the Spirit, but as people who are still worldly. He says, look, you guys are not Spirit-led people. You people are led by the world. You're led by the... the," And really what that is, because some of you that are churched, you got this idea of what that means. Others of you that aren't churched, you're like, what does that mean? And really, here's what it is. What it really means is that um, he's addressing the church and he's saying, look, you guys aren't led by the Spirit of God. Um, he's not leading the way you think. He's not leading the way you operate. Rather, you're operating after this, after this worldview and this system that's just kind of hedonistic. It's, 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 it's kind of just got logical mindset all around it. And it doesn't really have a biblical worldview. It just got this old, like, this is the way life is. And a lot of times in our faith journey, we attach a lot of that stuff to our Christianity. And I think that we need to back up a little bit. And we need to say, no, 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 that's good stuff. I wouldn't disagree with that quote, but does it line up biblically? Does it line up with the Bible? Is it actually in there? Because there's a lot of good stuff, like, you know, uh, that we think is Scripture, and we're like, wait up, that's not even found in the Bible. Like, that's not Bible. And so uh, let me just say, if we're going to grow, we need to challenge ourselves in that area. So again, whether you're here uh, for the first time or you're growing in your faith or, 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 you're, or you've been in faith for a long time, we need to be challenged towards growth. And so here it is. He says, look, you people, you, uh, you sh- I could not address you as people who live by the Spirit, but as people who are still worldly, mere infants in Christ. Now, could you just imagine, let's just, let's just use our imagination for a minute, okay? Uh, so here I am. And let's say I invite you to lunch with me this afternoon. We go to Texas Roadhouse. Y'all like Texas Roadhouse? All right. They usually, they serve, they, they, ha, they have a lot of food they serve there, but they do serve steak, right? Right? Now, how many of you would just be, like, beside yourself if I got to the table and I'm like, you know what? I'm going to take some milk 
and could you put that in a bottle for me? You know, because I really want to just, you know, like, nah, forget a bottle. We're going to do a sippy cup, okay? Can you just give me a sippy cup with milk and I will be apt? That's all I want. Any side, sir? No, just, just a little more milk will be all right when I get through with this. Like, right? That seems silly, right? You're like, really? That's just, like, I couldn't even imagine a grown man drinking a sippy cup. Like, can you imagine that? But yet, that's how we are in Christ. We're grown men and women, and we're walking around with a sippy cup saying, I've been a Christian for a long time. And God wants us to grow. He wants us to build our roots. He wants us to develop. He wants to get some steak out in front of us. But the problem is, is we're still holding on to our sippy cup. <laughs> like, no. Let me have it. You're like 35 years in Christ now. No. I like my sippy cup. Don't mess with my sippy cup. You know what I'm saying? And so he's saying, I wish I could address you that way, but you're mere infants in Christ. Verse 2, I gave you milk, not solid food, but you were not yet ready for it. And indeed, you are still not ready. So he makes the contrast. Guys, like I want to give you some steak, but you're still, you're still on the milk. You're still on the milk. Verse 3, let's move on. You are still worldly, he says. For since there is jealousy and quarreling among you, you are, not, are you not worldly? Are you not acting like mere humans? For when one says, I follow Paul, and another, I follow Apollos, are you not mere human beings? And so what he's, what's happening in the church and it, it's this interesting dynamic where the church is growing. God's doing some great things. There's a lot of growth. There's excitement ha- around it. But there's this argument that arises. And what the argument is, is they're like, one of them saying, I follow Paul, who's writing this, and the other one's saying, I follow Apollos. And they're arguing about it. Like, you know, shoot, you know, Pastor Paul's a lot better than, you know, Pastor Apollos. In fact, he'll beat you up. <laughs> so the point is, is that they're having this argument. And it's, it's in the church, it's within the church, and they're really acting like a bunch of spoiled brats. Because they're like, no, I follow Apollos, and the other one's, I follow Paul, and I'm sure that they threw in some, you know, because siblings, you know, when they fight, they don't always fight fair, you know what I'm saying? It's like, it's like, you know, Jesus likes me better because he gave me Paul, and you're, you're just following Apollos, you know, like, uh, could you imagine what that looked like? And the point is, is that they were very, uh, they were very infant in this, they were very juvenile in the way that they were responding and acting. And Paul's like, look, y'all got it wrong, you need to grow up, I want to give you some steak, but you're stuck on the milk. And then verse 5, what after all is Apollos and what is Paul? Only servants through whom you came to believe. You came to believe. You started out. You started your journey. You weren't a believer, but now you are. And as the Lord has assigned to each his task, he's saying, look, I have a task and Apollos has a task. And then he gets into the point of what we're talking about today, the value. What's the value? The value is this. I planted the seed, Apollos watered it, but God has been making it grow. And so he's saying, look, there, here's the way this works. God is doing some good things in us. And he's, he's allowing us to, to, to become believers. But look, we can't just stay where we started. We have to keep growing. And he's saying, look, look what am I? I'm just a servant. What is Apollos? He's just a servant. And he's really making this case that, look, we're, we, just don't, we all have a task. I just have a part. My part is cleaning the building. My part is like, you know, the only thing I get to do is I get to just kind of sit in and uh, I get to check in kids. Or I get, to, I get to teach kids. Or I get to lead a small group. Or I get to, like... The list goes on. I get to run a camera. I get to run a computer. I get to play an instrument. I get to sing. Y'all don't want me singing, that's for sure. But here's the thing. We all do those things, but God makes it grow. And so God desires growth. Not only does God desire growth, but it's His idea. He wants us to grow. And so it goes on to read, so neither the one who plants nor the one who waters is anything. Thank God it's not about me, right? Thank God it's not about us, but it's about God. And so neither the one who plants nor the one who waters is anything, but only God who makes things grow. There's the value again. God makes things grow. The one who plants and the one who waters have one purpose, and they will each be rewarded according to their own labor. 
for we are co-workers in God's service. And he's saying this, look, you, the people I'm writing to, y'all are God's field, you're his building, and it's growing. And I would just say that God is allowing us as a church to grow, and it's exciting. Like, I'm excited about it. I'm grateful for growth. I'm grateful for what, we're, what God is doing in our hearts, what God is doing in our lives, what God is doing in our church. But as a leader, I'm saying, God, may this always be about you. And God doesn't want to just bring growth to all of us. More importantly, I want you to make this personal. He wants you to grow. He wants to bring growth to your life. And so growth is God's idea. Um, growth is God's idea. He doesn't want us to stay where we're at. Um, it's not only his idea, but it's his desire. And I want to move to another text today because I think it really continues to emphasize what we're talking about. In Ephesians chapter 4, the exhortation towards maturity is expanded. We discover a discourse on what we, uh, what we find is church unity and maturity. And I want to pick up the discourse midway, midway through, but again, I want to encourage you to read before and after. When you go home, Ephesians chapter 4 should be part of your reading this week. You should really dig in and discover, because if you're going to grow, you have to discover. And so here we are, we move over to Ephesians chapter 4. Now this is a very power-packed portion of Scripture. But again, we're looking for the value we're talking about today. And we're probably going to come back to this in a couple weeks from now, but I want to just get the value for today. Because again, if we're going to create a culture as a church that is thriving, that is vibrant, that is life-giving, we have to be intentional with the values that we're putting in place. So today, we're talking about growth. Verse 11. So Christ himself gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the pastors, and the teachers to do a specific task. Like my job is, is not to do everything. My do- job is to do a task. I have a task to do. And when you read the Bible here, it's saying, look, Christ himself gave the apostles, the, pro- the prophets, the evangelists, the pastors and teachers to do what? To equip his people, meaning God's people, for works of service so that the body of Christ may be built up, so that there might be growth in the body of Christ until we all reach unity in the faith and in the maturity. I'm reading ahead. And see, I'm not I'm wrong in the knowledge of the Son of God and becoming mature. And so what God really wants us to do is He wants us to be built up. He wants the church to be built up. So He's called pastors like myself and leaders like the great leaders that we have in our church to help get us to the place where we're working in our gifts, where we're working in our talents, where we're working how God has gifted us, and we're doing that so that we can continue to expand God's work. But He's saying, look, so that they might be built up in the knowledge of the Son of God and become mature, attaining to the whole measure of the fullness of Christ. Man, could you imagine what that measurement looks like? Like, can you imagine what the measurement of the fullness of Christ, like Christ in His fullness? Like, could you just imagine Jesus walking in here and what that would look like? Like, physically walking in here? Now, I know uh, that for me, I start to envision what what it would be like, you know, and I'm thinking, like, how would I respond, you know, would I, would I be starstruck, like, Jesus, you know what I'm saying, like, can I get a selfie, you know, uh, like, goodness, Lord, we, we got some work to do, right, uh, but he's, could you imagine Jesus walking in, and, and then, what is that measure, the fullness of Christ, like, I, I envision it like this, and I don't want to get stuck here too long, but let me just envision, just give you one little snippet here, like I envision when, I, when you're a child, you always, you know, you want to play dress up, you know. And girls are really good at this, but boys do it too. We just like, our thing, you know, girls, you're like in a dress that don't fit you in high heels, but you're like, you're like, whoa, you know, how you doing in that? Good, you know, like, whoa, Jesus. But here's what, here's what little boys do. Little boys get around their, their uncle's stuff or their daddy's stuff, and they put boots on. They get like army fatigues, you know what I'm saying? And they're like all dressed up and they got a hat on. They got a gun. They're like, yeah, what are you doing? We're going to the jungle, man. You know, little boys are awesome, man. And, and, but they all play dress up, right? But we don't fit. And I, I, sometimes when we think about those clothing, we think, man, they're so much bigger. And, and I really feel like it's like that with Jesus. Like Jesus is so much like the full measure, like, who is he? Like, I want to walk in that. And sometimes you're like walking like this. And sometimes you're like, but I want to walk in the fullness of Christ. I don't want to just be here. I want to go levels and say, God, let me grow. 
Let me get on the full armor one of these days where I'm fully fit. And I'm like, man, this is, this is right and this is for my life and this is for my leadership. I want to grow and I want you to grow. And so becoming uh, the full measure of Christ, then we will no longer be infants tossed back and forth by the waves and blown here and there by every wind of teaching and by the cunning and craftiness of people in their deceitful scheming. Instead, instead, speaking the truth in love, we will grow to become in every respect the mature body of Him who is the head, that is Christ. And so we're talking about maturity. We're talking about becoming the full measure of Christ. All of that love, all of that compassion, all of that grace, all of that truth. Because Jesus, remember, He came in grace and truth. We like to live in a world that's either grace or truth. Because grace and truth is messy. But that's exactly what Jesus came to do. He came to be truthful. And man, truth cuts to the core, right? But He came to be graceful because grace loves us and embraces us. And this is who Jesus came to be. And in verse 15, I like what it says. Instead, speaking the truth in love, we will grow to become, there's our key value again, we will grow to become in every respect the mature body of Him who is the head. That is Christ. Let me just say this. The body of Christ is not a bobblehead. The body of Christ is not a bobblehead. Jesus is, like, he's got, a, he's got a big head, but He's not, it's not because He's, big-headed is because he's mature and his body shouldn't walk around as this little you know bobblehead experience no we should grow we should develop every day you personally in my family in as our church we should be growing we should be developing and experiencing all that he has in store for us is this making sense this morning for you we have to grow in verse 16 from him the whole body joined and held together by every supporting ligament, grows and builds itself up in love as each part does its work. One of my favorite verses in all of the Bible. Like we are a body. All of us are a part of it. And guess what? We have to grow into the full measure of Christ. We have to grow and become all He desires us to be. And I don't want to walk around knowing that we serve Christ who is this completely mature Savior of the world, and yet we're just walking around as this feeble, weak, bobblehead experience where we're not being who God has asked us to be. And so, as I prepare to close today, on a growth continuum, we find ourselves in a couple of places along the journey. In particular, I believe there are five places that we find ourselves in as a believer. There, it's not going to be up here, so you need to write this part down. You need to take notes on this one. Because there are five places that I think we find ourselves in when it comes to this growth continuum. We're here and God wants us to be up here. We're here and we want to become just like Christ. We want to attain to the full measurement. Like I, I, want, to, I, want, I want the, the, the you know, tape measure to come out and for God to be like, yep, just like Jesus. You know, if there was a little line on there that said just like Jesus, I want to reach to that. Now I'm imperfect. I'm not going to be there. From moment to moment, I'm going to feel like choking people. It's just for fun, though, for real. It's just fun. Um, I, I'm going to have areas, and then God is like, that's not about you. That's not about her, son. That's about you. I'm trying to work something out of you. I'm like, okay, Lord, I know I got some, I got some work to be done in my heart. So I want to get to that place where it says full measurement of Christ. I want to get there. But in order to get there, I've got to know where I'm at. So five places of where we're at in that, okay? Number one is what I would call a seeker. A lot of people get confused about that word. They're like, what does it mean? What does it not mean? Here's what it means for us, okay? What it means for us is a seeker is somebody who's looking for truth. They're looking for, they they want to grow in their faith, but they really don't know where to start. They don't really know how to start. In fact, maybe you are a a seeker today. Maybe you're here and you're kind of like, you're like, man, let's try this out. I mean, what could it hurt? You know, let's just give it a try. Let's figure it out. Um, you know, everybody, everybody starts there. I remember being a seeker, and I, I was what you call a forced seeker because I found God in a jail cell. Amen. Like, I was forced. I was like, Jesus, there ain't nobody else here. You here? You real? Like, let's talk. Uh, can you get me out of here? I promise I'll. Let's make a deal. Seeker. And then there's a prodigal, the second one. First one is a seeker. The second one is a prodigal. Let me just say, a prodigal, you already know who you are. I don't even have to tell you who you are. But a prodigal is somebody who you grew up in faith and you wandered from it for a long time. 
And, and, and now it's time to come home. And here's the problem with you, is that for you, you felt like if I come home, everybody's going to judge me and look at me and curse me and condemn me. But I just want to remind you that the story of the prodigal son, the father didn't do any of that. He came with wide open arms. He said, come home, son. Enter into the joys of your house. Welcome home. And so for every prodigal, I would say to you, welcome home this morning. You're here. You say, yeah, but you don't know where I've been. You don't know what I've done. It doesn't matter. God loves you right where you're at. But guess what? He loves you so much, he's not going to leave you there. And so he's going to challenge you towards growth. So you're either a seeker, you're a prodigal, or you're a believer. And let me just say, you come to that place where you put your faith in Christ. You've come to that place where you said, look, I'm a believer. Man, I don't know who this young man is right here. I've never seen you before. I, I, yeah, you right there, you got glasses on. I don't know you. I want to meet you after service. But I just felt as I looked over there, God says he has something incredible in store for your life. And I, I don't know what that means for you. I'm not trying to like speak anything crazy into your life. I'm just saying maybe you've heard that before. Um, so that's not something new. But all I would say is like when I looked over there, I saw something bright on your face. And I believe God has something incredible in store for your life. Let's talk afterward. But I believe that's from God. Um, I'm sorry, I, I couldn't move on without saying that. Like if I would have, I would have been disobedient to what God was just speaking into my heart. But, but here's the thing. We're, we're either a believer uh, or we're a seeker, prodigal, or a believer. And we get into that place where we start to say, you know what, I, I, I want to I operate in that. What does it mean to be a believer? And let me just say, believers are brand new babies and fully mature, like attaining to the full measure. We're all over there. So you're either a seeker, a prodigal, a believer. Here's the next one. Or you're a leader. Fourth one is a leader. And I'll tell you what, you can't just be a believer and just kind of sit around for the, your whole life. Nobody wants to sit on the bench the whole time, right? Like, I'm getting ready to coach sixth grade girls basketball. And I'm like, man, I am too busy for this, Lord. What am I doing? But it's going to be fun. But nobody wants to sit on the bench the whole time. It's Parks and Rec, so we, we, we can't. Nobody gets to sit on the bench in Parks and Rec. So here's the thing. In my faith, I don't want to just be a believer sitting on the bench. I want to be a leader. And then the last one is what I would call a developer. A developer is somebody who develops other leaders. And in fact, I'm saying, God, I don't, I don't, I don't want to just be a believer. In fact, God, I don't even want to just be a leader. I want to be a leader of leaders. And ten years ago when I came to this church, I had a vision that God would give us the ability to be a leader of leaders. And I'm just saying, church, that God is now positioning us in a place where we're beginning to speak into other leaders' lives. Where I really feel like He's seasoned us enough and now we're going to operate. In fact, I'm praying in the year ahead for a conference that we would host here at the church where we can add value to other leaders and to say, hey, guys, we don't have it all figured out, but here's what we do know, and we want to give it away to you. And so I pray. When I first moved here, I felt God would do that. And then he also put two books on my heart to write back then. And, I, and I've held on to them for 10 years. And I'm just saying, God, is now the time because I want to develop other leaders. I want to be a church that develops other leaders. And so you're either a seeker, a prodigal, a believer, a leader, or a developer. And I ask you this, where are you? Where are you? And what steps can you take to grow towards the next level? You see, I know I'm a leader. I know that. Am, am I a developer? I don't know that yet. I'm, I'm definitely in. I'm like, I got one foot in. You know, I got my toe on the water. I'm like, okay. But I want to just jump all in and I want to help develop other leaders. I want to help develop other churches. I want to help develop other people. I want to develop other leaders, not just other churches, but right here in the context of our church, I want to develop other leaders. And, and I really felt convicted about this. Some of you, maybe this is just too far ahead for you. Just stay with me. We're almost done here. But here's the thing. I really felt like God said to me recently, um, or challenged me recently, like, you want to develop le other leaders, but you're not inviting any other leaders to the table. And I was like, oh, okay. Yeah, but what if they're not ready yet? That's the point, son. Get your game face on. Get them to the table. Okay, Lord. Yeah, but what, what if? Stop making excuses. Get them to the table. 
And so I really felt this challenge that many of you in this place, you wouldn't call yourself a leader, but in three months from now, you're going to be a leader. You say, I don't know about that. I know it. You're going to be a leader. And six months from now, you're going to be leading others. You're going to be saying, how did that happen? I remember six months ago, Pastor Paul was talking about, you know, all these different steps. And I was just a seeker. Now I was a prodigal, man. And now I'm a leader. That's what we're believing. That's what we're expecting. So where are you? And what steps can you grow, take to grow towards the next level? And more specifically, what can you do in the next seven days? Here it is. Seven days. What can you do to go to the next level? What can you do? And maybe you say, well, I can't make that big of a jump yet. Well, maybe you just make like one small baby step. And maybe today the step for you is, I believe in Jesus. Maybe it's that, that's where you start. But what can you do in the next seven days? As we commit to growth, we partner with God's Spirit and His purpose for our lives. And remember, growth is God's idea and it's His desire. And so growth is powerful because it has the potential, listen to this, growth is powerful because it has the potential to not only change you, but to change those around you. And let me just say it this way, if the Lord tarries, it will change those that come after us. And you know what? I I pray that Jesus comes today. Y'all ready for that? Like, Lord, just come back. Let's go home already. I'm ready. Like, I'm ready. I'm ready. But if the Lord doesn't come back for a hundred years, I want a hundred years from now, my great-great-grandchildren to say, y'all don't know my great-great-granddaddy. Homeboy was ill. Some of you are like, I don't know what he just said. That's my great-great-granddaddy. He was an amazing man of God. He, He was a crazy thinker. He got out on a limb sometimes. He did some stuff that looked like it was going to fail. He, he did some things that he pushed the envelope. He raised up other leaders. There's churches all across the world now because he decided to take Junction Community Church and say, you know what, we're not going to be limited by who, we, who they said we were. We're going to believe that we can impact the world from right here in Grand Junction, Colorado. That's my great, great, great granddaddy. I forgot his name, but he was a good guy. (laughs) You see, as we commit to growth, it not only changes us, it changes those around us, but it affects those that will come after us. And I want to make a difference for those that will come after me. You see, I know one day, and I know you're all just going to be so depressed when I say this, one day there is going to be another pastor of Junction Community Church. And you're like, You're like, man, I don't ever want to see that. Me either. But when he comes, like I came, a 27-year-old punk that didn't know what he was doing, I want that 27-year-old punk to have a game plan and a church around him that's going to support him and and that's going to set up a system that when this dude comes, I mean, he's going to hit. Man, I feel like I was was trying to bunt when I first got here. Like, Lord, can we just... But, you know, homeboy's going to switch, step up to the bat, and he's going to be knocking home runs, man. Why? Because we set up a place that will allow him to thrive. Like, I don't know. Some of you can get that. Some of you maybe can't. Um, I know you all be sad, and there will be a mandatory three years of depression when I leave. But point being, I want to set something up for somebody else who's going to come after me. In my family, in my leadership, in our church, in our community. I can go on and on, but I better close. And so I close with this. God has a purpose for us. And his purpose exceeds us. Imagine that. It's not just about us. His purpose exceeds us. And as we prepare to close here today, I want to ask you this question. Have you grown? How have you grown in the last year? For some of you that would consider yourself spiritually mature, believers in Christ, How have you grown in the last year? Ouch. And let me just say it this way. Not only how have you grown, but in a year from now, where do you want to be? I don't want to be in the same place a year from now. And I can tell you this much. I'm definitely not where I was a year ago. There's been a lot of growth in my life. A lot of challenge. Now, I'm not perfect. I'm in progress. But I'm better than I was a year ago. And a year from now, I want to be in a whole different place. And so I leave you with this takeaway today. Growth 
is God's goal for my life. It's personal. Growth is God's goal for, goal for your life. Doesn't matter where you're at. Doesn't matter where you've been. God's goal is growth in your life. And so you have to remind yourself every day, growth is God's goal for my life. And today, I can't just go with the status quo and the mediocrity of my life. I've got to push forward. I've got to grow today. I've got to get in God's Word. I've got to get in a small group. I've got to go through growth track. I've got to, I've got to get here on a Sunday morning because I've got to make sure that I'm growing. And you can't grow if you're not here. You can't grow if you're not in a small group. You can't grow if, you're not, if you've not gone through growth track. Growth track, we had it yesterday. It was awesome. We're going to have it again in a, in a couple of months. I want to encourage you to do that. Go through growth track, but you can't grow if you're not doing these things. And so every day I want to tell myself, God, let me be reminded, growth is your idea and it's your goal for my life. Father, we thank you for this morning. And we thank you that growth is your idea, that it's your goal for our lives, that it's your goal for our church. And I got to say that, Lord, I am truly excited to see your work in us as you push us toward growth. But if we're ever going to grow, it starts in our relationship with you. And so all over this place, everyone watching online, if you're here today and you say, look, I've never committed my life to Christ. I do not have a relationship with Him. I just want you to know that growth starts there. That if you're going to grow, it starts in a relationship with Him. So if you've never made taken that step, I want to give you that opportunity today. So if you're here today and you say, I want to commit to growth and I need to start by committing my life to Christ. If that's you, would you just lift your hand right where you're at, really high. God sees your hands. God sees your hands. God sees your hands. God sees your hand. If there's anybody else here, you say, that's me. And you just lift your hand real high and say, that's me. I want to commit to growth today. I want to commit my life to Christ. God sees your hands. Go ahead and put it right back down. I'm going to ask everyone listening to my voice, whether it's online or here, and everyone who raised your hand, to repeat a simple prayer with me. Say, Jesus, today I commit my life to you. Teach me your ways. Help me to grow from this day forward. I confess you as my Lord, as my Savior. And I trust you to lead me and allow me to grow. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Can we just put our hands together? Let's all stand together.